Pope Francis has given us a challenge, a challenge to make sure that we care for this earth on which we live. Ah, the challenge is, are we really doing what we should be doing? Stay tuned. <music> I think you're going to be challenged by this program. As you know, we're living in a world in which the topic of, of our Earth, the topic of caring for our Earth is, is very relevant. What about smog? What about big businesses that are somehow really ruining the Earth in which we go? What about the melting ice that's happening up in the northern, northern part of our Earth and down in south? What does it mean for us as followers of Christ? And what should our reaction be? Well. We've got a very special guest with us today, a, a, a woman who has given her life to Christ, a woman who has also given her life in that dedication to Christ to a beautiful study of the Bible. And we're going to get some insights into, into understanding what the Pope is saying. Sister Diane, God bless you. Thank you for coming all the way My from pleasure. Chicago to That's be right. with us. Thank you. It's a blessing to have you here in Southern here. California and talk about this. The Holy Father has, has um, stirred the water and he's caused an awful lot of people to all oftentimes be upset, mm -hmm. but also kind of awaken some awareness in us that we are responsible for this earth that we share with everyone else in a very important way. Tell me a little bit about what's the problem with regard to the earth in which we live. Is there really a problem that we're facing? Several years ago, uh, I had the opportunity to spend a little time in Taiwan. Mm. And this was several years ago, and on the main street, people were walking around with m m surgical masks oh, on. Yeah. Uh, that's the, the worst air pollution I have ever experienced. Um, but we know, again, several years ago, there was a real problem in Love Canal in New York, where there was an, uh, a high incidence of cancer, and they discovered it was because it would, the, the land in which they were living was polluted. So we have, and those are just two instances, we have experiences of, of air pollution caused by human living, the way we live. We have instances of land pollution, and one wonders how much of cancer is really environmental. Wow. So, and that's just looking at how it affects us as, as earthlings. So yes, it's, there is a problem. Pope Francis has come out and he's made a very strong statement in a letter, um, an encyclical that we call in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. a real statement about demanding our awareness of the problem and then challenging us to do something about it. It's, it's the first encyclical that is uh, dedicated explicitly to the whole question of ecology. But it's not the first time a religious body or a major religious uh, leader has made statements about ecology. World Council of Churches has for decades made some so, very... So not just Catholics. Not just Catholics, it, it, okay. not just Catholics at all. And, and I think if one would Google, what would we do without Google? <laughs> if one would Google in ecology and you would find that, meth, you know, not only Christians, but you've got Buddhist statements as well. And and in terms of the Catholic Church, I think all the way back to the late 1990s, popes have been making some statements about the responsibility that we have for the rest of the natural world, the world, earth, not only on which we live, but earth from which we come. Science tells us, not just religion, science tells us we are earthlings, which means, yeah. now it may take five million years, but after five million years, this is what earth produces, you and me. So there's a real So there is a there's a very definite connection. So what Francis has done, what Pope Francis has done now is dedicated a whole letter. There are six chapters. This and this is a long letter. This is not a short letter. Six chapters where he talks about climate control, but he also says that we have to change our way of understanding not just how we live on this earth, but who we are as human beings, that we are not separate from the natural world. 
we are part of it, mm. that we are part of it. And he, he emphasizes several different points that, that what catches my attention is the question of interconnectedness. We are connected to the world because we are part of it. We are not separate from it. Say we, more about that. I don't, I don't, explain that to me a little bit more. Well, we can't live without it. Ah, we, we, you know, we cannot live without food, and where does the food come from? We cannot, cannot live without water, and where does the water come from? We cannot live without air, and where does the air come from? It's all part of Earth. It's all part of wow, okay. the whole system of Earth. And we cannot live without it. It can live without us, <laughs> but we cannot live without it. So in a very real sense, we are part of it. And as children of the Enlightenment, we don't normally think that way. The wonder of the Enlightenment, and I think that whole movement of what, the Enlightenment, the enlightenment is, is a movement of intellectual understanding and critical thought. And it has enabled us to step back and analyze things. But it didn't invite us then or teach us how to step back in again. So we, we, we see sometimes ourselves as separate from. And if we are separate from, well, maybe we don't need it. We forget we need it. Mm -hmm. We need it desperately. And so he, he speaks about uh, the, our need to see ourselves as interconnected with Earth. So if the Earth isn't able to produce because we're polluting it or causing all kind of problems. We pay the price we're, because we're we, not going to be able right. to have food. We're not exactly. going to have clothes or. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, exactly. And there's another theme that he em emphasizes, which I think is very important for us to deal with, and that's interconnectedness and interdependence. And that's not part of the thinking of many people in the West. But we like I, to no, be so independent. I'm, I'm, I'm dependent. Well, from what you just said, I really am dependent on the earth. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. For, for my food and for my drink exactly. and for my life. Exactly. The image that I like to use is like the human body. And we read in St. Paul when he's talking about the church, he uses the image of body to talk about how members of the church are interrelated and interdependent. And how can I, how can I get along without my hand exactly. or my foot exactly. or whatnot? Exactly, exactly. And, and, and Paul says, speaking about the church, can the hand say to the foot, because you're not a hand, I have no need for you. I think that's a good image to understand how humankind, men and women, are part of the natural world interrelated and interdependent. So the Pope is just kind of coming and saying, hey, wake up to reality. Right. And that maybe we're forgetting it because we get a little bit selfish in our world of using things and sometimes using the earth in a destructive way right. that kind of stifles with right. the productivity that we need in order to live. And it's crazy. Right. And, and I, I, I would not say a little selfish. I would say very selfish. Um, we forget that we are interdependent. We think that God created the universe or created for sure earth and gave it to us to do what we want. And that, first of all, that is the, an erroneous way of reading the Genesis creation accounts. It doesn't say that. But because we, we are superior, and I mean, that's, that's a whole question as well. But there's no question that we have certain abilities that no other creature on earth that we know of has. I mean, beavers can, can build dams, but they don't write poetry. Yes. You know, so there is, we have certain abilities. But we lack other abilities. We do not have the same kind of senses that dogs have. Yeah. We cannot smell when somebody's, you know, suffering from cancer or something or other, or going to have some kind of a seizure. We don't have the same kind of eyes. Our our abilities are slight, are not slightly, but they are different and highly toned. In no way am I suggesting that they are not important. But I still want to say, everything about us, everything about us, is earthbound. Our imagination, our poetry, yeah. it's always about an experience of earth. The sunset, our music. the moon. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, the rhythm. Where do we get rhythm? You know, we get rhythm from, from the heartbeat. We get rhythm from the movements of earth. From the ocean. From the ocean. Even our understanding of God is all earthbound and wrapped up with earth, which is understandable because that's our experience. Sometimes that limits our understanding of God when, you know, you say, you know, God really is not 
the man upstairs. First of all, he's not a man, and secondly, it's not a he, and third, it's not upstairs. He's right with us. Exactly. But you see, how do you understand that except with earth understanding, with human language? We call that, you know, anthropomorphic. Stay tuned. Listen to this message. We're going to be right back. One of the most charming aspects of Jesus was that not only did he heal people, not only did he walk on water, but Matthew and Mark say that whenever he was talking to a large group of people, maybe thousands of people, he only told stories. I love that because thinking of Jesus as a master storyteller is so intriguing. And I've written a book about the parables of Jesus. The book is called 15 Faces of God. I go through 15 parables, uh, the exciting ones, and then I show how Jesus is saying in this magnificent love that he has for his Father, this is who my Father is. So as you listen, you're going to hear various, various faces of God searching humble, listening, celebrating, loving, forgiving, proud, and even optimistic. I want you to have this book. We're going to be giving you a special offer. For $10, you're going to be able to have this book. This will be a great way for you to help our television ministry and also find a wonderful way of understanding how Jesus uses these magnificent stories as opening the door for us to know who God the Father is. So please, a $10 donation or $10 or more if you can to allow yourself to be enriched and to also bless this ministry, this television ministry, which is continually needing your prayers but also needing your financial support. Please, make sure you get this book. Sister Diane, we've spoken about the importance of understanding this earth in which we live as a vital part of what it means to be human. And that if we ignore the earth or we pollute the earth, we're in many ways just kind of hurting ourselves, and the Holy Father is calling us to an awareness of a, a interconnectivity. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. How can I respond in a practical way? In your life, mm -hmm. have, you, have you taken on some challenges in your own life that maybe could give us some help as to how we could maybe... Well, right. First of all, I, I think part of the complication is um, we are inundated with advertising that tells us we need something. It insists that we need something. I remember seeing several times, there is a, there is a car ad, and I don't remember what car it is, but the, the ad says, get the car that you deserve. <laughs> That's, that troubles me. First of all, who deserves a car, <laughs> you know? But what we're saying, of course, is get something best, get something better, and also get more. Our whole system yeah. of living is based on consuming. And we must consume or we will not survive. But do, are, we, are we reasonable and thoughtful and reflective consumers? That's a real serious issue. Just recently in Chicago, uh, I got something in the mail from my, my uh, ComEd. Now, I don't understand all of the That's complexities. That's electricity. That's electricity. And so one of my deliverers can give me a kind of, uh, a kind of energy force that, that le lessens the carbon footprint. But it says it may cost a little bit more. Now, when you, I don't have a large electrical bill, yes. but I'm a, you know, a red-blooded American and I want what's cheap. Yes. I mean, if I can get something that doesn't cost as much, you know, I, I want that. However, I want more, but not pay more. Yes. All right. Now, that's within us, almost as if it's in the, our genes, yes. because that's so much a part of the atmosphere. 
we've got to counteract that. So I have to say, as they say, put your money where your mouth is. And uh, if it's going to cost me a little bit more, it may mean, you know, maybe I can't have, uh, uh, you know, Diet Pepsi or something or other, you know, which is minimal, minimal. I should choose those things that will make the least amount of damage in my world. Wow. All right. Another question. How many pairs of shoes does a person need? Really? And sometimes, you know, we wear things, and we, uh, I grew up in working class. We wore things out. We don't wear things out anymore. Does anybody even know how to patch? Now, I'm not suggesting that we have to dress, you know, uh, as if we're street people. We're, and there's nothing wrong with street people, but as if we have nothing except what we pick gotcha, out, gotcha. you know. Uh, uh, the, the very dispossessed. I'm not suggesting, you know, and I'm not suggesting, you know, that we do not purchase, but I think we have to really be very serious about the way we purchase. I mean, things like that. So, so clothes, we, clothes, food? electricity. You know, the, the, the Holy Father, I think, in the, in the cyclical said, how much time do we need to have the air conditioner on? Exactly. You know, maybe, maybe that's, that's a superfluous like, thing. Well, but also, we, he's talking about changing our values. And, uh, and he made distinctions such as when, when the Dow Jones goes down, that's front page news. Yes. When children die of starvation, that's not news. Yeah. We've got to shift our thinking. Where are our values? What in life do we really value? Do we really value life? And so uh, uh, we at least do recycling now, you know, but that's not enough. Mm -hmm. Many people want uh, organic food. Organic food costs a little bit more. So it, the, our purchasing powers. A whole change of mentality. A whole of, change yes. of mentality, not simply changing behaviors. We must. Sometimes change of behavior changes thinking. Sometimes change of thinking changes behavior. And the issue is not simply because if we don't, we will suffer. We will suffer. But the issue is we have no right to it. It is not ours by right. The land is not ours. Psalm 24 begins, the earth is the Lord's. It's not ours. And God did not give it to us except it was entrusted to us to act as stewards. Subdue and have dominion really means take care of the land. It, 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 it's the language... Not, not, not be indifferent and, and, and use it so that it's wasted. Exactly. Or, or dominate. Yeah. Or dominate. Um, the image is really the image of ancient monarchy. They are the ones who subdue and have dominion. No. So, I mean, that's, that's a, a theological image. But if you look carefully, it, you know, they are to do it as representatives of God, not simply as people for whom we claim a kind of dominion. So it really demands uh, a transformation of thinking. The, the, the Greek word or the theological word is a metanoia, a change of mind and heart. Now, that brings up something, uh, a real important question, because it's not only a change of heart with regard to ecology or the uh, appreciation of the earth. How do we change people's mentality? How do we bring that about? Um, the Pope writes an encyclical and challenges people, and yet time and again you and I are trying to get people to change because mm -hmm. we see that there's something better going on. Mm -hmm. Give me, some, give, me, give me some pointers, would you? What, what do you think would be good ways of, of talking? Let's talk just about this, this issue. How could we get somebody, let's say, let's say someone is a capitalist and he has a lot of money. We're all capitalists. Well, I guess so. <laughs> but let's say that he has an awful lot of money and he's got a big business and he's got a lot of employees and he's really just happy with himself because he's being able to give jobs to people that otherwise wouldn't have this. But the problem is that they're living in squalor and they're perhaps living under conditions that might be something of a, of a slave nature. How do you get to someone and be able to say, let's change, let's change the direction of our life? That's a terrible question to ask you right it's here. It's not. 
And let me explain why it's not a terrible correction. I'm not going to answer it. But I'm going to <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> but I'm going to give an example. Pope Francis, he has changed the thinking of many people. How? Oh. By living it himself. Uh. So in, in a, how do you change the, the lives of people? You first change yourself. Okay. You know? okay. But look at what he has done. People are thrilled with Pope Francis. What has he done? He has shown a genuine simplicity of life. Yeah, yeah. He has shown a great love for people universally. He reaches out to people that other people don't want to touch. He, there, and, and it's not just people in the church and even people in the church. He tells those of us who are ministers in the church, don't sit in the church and wait for people to knock on the door. Go out to them. So in a very real sense, I think he himself, and I'm, there's no question in my mind, he never made up his mind when he woke up some morning, I'm going to give them a good example. It's just it. it it's That's just who he is. is. That's, That's is. just who he is. And look what he has done. He has show, he had, and not just his words, but you know, talk about put your money where your mouth is. His words are an example of how he lives. He's a very simple man. You know, I mean, and, and so many pictures, like he would, he would use, you know, the L to go to work when he's a cardinal. Yes. And y you think that doesn't make an impression? And then he chooses this, this humble little part of a hotel to, and, to be his home. Exactly. And yeah. the reason is because he doesn't want to live alone. That's, that's the primary reason. He doesn't want to live alone. He wants to live with other people because he knows I need other people. But he needs other people in a relatively simple place. He stands in line in the cafeteria with his tray. Yeah. After he becomes pope, he goes and pays his bill at yeah. the hotel. Yeah. A little aside, one of my favorite expressions was when he came to pay the bill, he said to the, the person behind the counter, I registered with a different name. <laughs> I love that. I think that's a perfect example of what do you do with these people? You show what can be done. And this is a happy man. Yeah. He's a happy man. Now, what can I do? Uh, again, you know, look at my life, just as everyone, you know, look at, you, look at your life. Yes. And, and it, see to what extent... Do I live, as the expression that is used, a large carbon footprint? Hmm. And we, we all say, you know, you can't take it with you. Well, we sure try to. You know, we sure try to, you know, hoard things up. For what purpose? A sense of insecurity frequently. So we do those things, but also listen to others and, you know, uh, voting power. I remember years ago, if you'll remember, Jimmy Carter wanted us to, to use solar power, and we, the country laughed at him. Yes. Where would we be today had we left, you know, taken his advice yeah. with solar power? And, and, and look at, we left at Al Gore, you know, with his concern. I mean, do we, have to, do we have to walk over bodies before we realize maybe we should listen to some of these yeah. people? Yeah. So, you know, um, and, and this sounds so terribly negative and gloomy, and I don't intend it to be, because all of these, these movements, all of these insights, the desire, you know, to, to lessen the carbon footprint, all of that, I firmly believe, is evidence of the power of God working in the minds and hearts of people. The very fact that we are aware of these things as desperate needs, and also sometimes, I, I mean, some of the errors are not just mistakes, they're, they're sinful. Yeah. It's very sinful, all right? Um, and the very fact that we are beginning to realize that, I believe, is the power of God working in the minds of people. Now, it might be brand new to us, but as I said earlier, it's not brand new to a lot of people. Amen. I mean, we've got what used to be called the, the you know, the tree huggers. Well, they had a, they had a point there, yes. you know, and you save the whales. They had a point there. And I remember there was a big thing on television or in the news several years ago. Uh, there weren't any bumblebees anymore. Yeah. Who needs bumblebees? <laughs> and the answer is everybody needs bumblebees. Yes. Now, I'm not crazy about mosquitoes, all right? Some place along the line, they have a place. <laughs> I just hope that it's not where I'm living. <laughs> but I, I don't think we realize, you know, we, everything is for our convenience. If it's convenient for us, 
then it's good. If it any way inconvenience us, get rid of it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, get rid of the, of the uh, coyotes, or is it the wolves? The wolves in Yellowstone. And we got rid of the wolves. And now, and, and now we got to you know, bring introduce them, back, them, bring, bring them back. back. Because we don't realize it's all of a piece. Stay tuned. We're going to be praying for you and for some of your intentions. One of the most charming aspects of Jesus was that he only told stories. I love that because thinking of Jesus as a master storyteller is so intriguing. And I've written a book about the parables of Jesus. The book is called 15 Faces of God. I go through 15 parables, uh, the exciting ones, and then I show how Jesus is saying in this magnificent love that he has for his Father, I want you to have this book. We're going to be giving you a special offer. For $10, you're going to be able to have this book. This will be a great way for you to help our television ministry, which is continually needing your prayers, but also needing your financial support. Please. Make sure you get this book. Uh, and I encourage you, would you please make sure that you, you do get in touch with us. There's a number right at the bottom of the screen. Give a call. There are people here who would like to listen to you and pray with you and bring about some blessings in your life. Keep also in mind our uh, app. We have this iGod Today. If you have an iPhone or an Android, you can get a daily message on the, on the Bible, a little three-minute little reflection on, on the readings of the day. Remember that, iGod Today. And go to our webpage and make sure you get in touch with all kinds of things that are happening. But we, we've got some wonderful people that have written in to us here. You know, um, Irene from Rhode Island. Um, um, praying for her sister, Teresa, that she can have peace. Uh, Teresa from Kansas, uh, the family is, is having a separation, mm -hmm. praying for the healing of the family. Anne from Arizona, um, please pray for our bills, yes. <laughs> that we can fill bill, bills. A 95-year-old mother, uh, Drew from California, she, she had a difficult fall. Um, and here's Margaret from California, recovering from stomach cancer. And then here's Gabrielle from Minnesota. Um, she herself needs to be freed from drugs and struggling with a boyfriend. Lord, we believe that you're a God who listens to prayers when we pray. And you bring about radical changes in our life because prayers. Prayer makes a difference. Bless these people, Lord. Bring about the healing. Bring about the union of the brokenness in families. Bring about the peace that we're all looking for. And now, may Jesus' love for you always make you smile.